Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm Ben. Today I'm going to be doing another deep dive head-to-head -head video, and this time I'm doing the Les Paul Jr. Billy Joe Armstrong edition Gibson vs. Epiphone. Let's go. So I'm not going to get into the very long history of the Les Paul Jr. That will be a video maybe in the future. But I do want to get into the history of the Gibson Billy Joe Armstrong signature Les Paul Jr. Firstly, if you don't know Billy Joe Armstrong, he's the lead man, the front guy, the lead singer, whatever you want to call it, main songwriter for Green Day. Somewhere along the line, Billy Joe came across a 1956 Gibson Les Paul Jr., which he named Floyd, and that's where these guitars come from. Gibson in 2005 reached out to him and said, Hey, let's do a partnership of Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. So here's what we know about Floyd as manufactured by Gibson. Floyd, a Les Paul Jr., was made in 1956 by Gibson. It was a very simple guitar. It had a mahogany neck, mahogany body, rosewood fretboard, 12 inch radius. The entire guitar was 24 and 3 quarter inch scale. Electronically, it had one P90 pickup and one set of controls, a volume and a tone. The volume pot was most likely a 500K and the tone was most likely a 250. But there are examples from this year that have 500K all around. There's some that have 300K all around. Just another example of Gibson's world-renowned quality control. Now, Floyd had a thick 50s neck. It was most likely measuring around 0.9 inches at the first fret and close to an inch or maybe just a little bit above that around the 12th fret. That's basically the gist of Floyd. The inspiration for Gibson and Billy Joe Armstrong's collaboration. In 2006, Gibson releases the first edition of the Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. guitar. It has an MSRP of $1799, but most retailers are selling it for about $1600. Just like Floyd, this guitar had a mahogany neck and body and a rosewood fretboard. But whereas Floyd had a 50s neck profile, because it's from the 50s, this guitar now had a 60s slim taper neck, with the first fret measuring around 0.81 inches and the 12th fret measuring around 0.91 inches, so substantially thinner. Floyd also had the traditional Gibson P90 pickup, whereas this guitar had the H90 pickup. Now H90 stands for hum canceling P90, or basically a humbucking P90, so this guitar's P90 was a humbucker, so it was not a P90. That's actually not entirely accurate, but more or less it's it was definitely a different sound character than a P90. And from the comments that I've read, it doesn't seem like people were too thrilled about this pickup. Sure, there's every once in a while somebody says it's great. But by and large, it seems like people want a P90 if it looks like a P90. Now a question that I have is Gibson says that they worked really hard with Billy Joe Armstrong to come up with this H90 pickup. So is it like, hey Billy, what are you doing this weekend? Come on down, let's wrap some coil and we'll run some magnets and see what we can come up with. Or is it more like, hey Billy, if we give you say, a third of all the money we make on these guitars, can we put this experimental pickup in it? And I guess that brings up another question I have, which is the artist edition of a guitar and how much it should deviate from what it's based on, or should it be similar? I think that's part of a, a broader discussion in general, but I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are, and if you've got some, leave them in the comments. All right, moving on. The guitar sports a blank truss rod cover, and if you were to flip that guitar over, underneath the truss rod cover on the back side of the neck is where Billy Joe Armstrong's signature would be. Now this is gonna be a bit confusing, but try and bear with me. This guitar came in three finishes, ebony, vintage sunburst, and classic white. Because things are always a little Gibson at Gibson, the ebony and vintage sunburst finish came with a rosewood fretboard. The classic white finish had an ebony fretboard. The classic white and vintage sunburst finishes had black single ply pick guards, whereas the ebony finish had a five ply tortoiseshell pick guard. The vintage sunburst had gold top hat knobs, the ebony had amber top hat knobs, and the classic white had black top hat knobs. Now I said I wasn't going to get too much into the history of the standard Les Paul Jr., but I do think it's important to point out that at this time, Gibson is selling that model for nearly half of what the Billy Joe Armstrong model is selling for, with most retailers selling it for about $700, whereas the Billy Joe Armstrong model was $1,400. Sometime around 2011-2012, Gibson phases out the classic white finish, and the two remaining fretboards, which were rosewood, are now replaced with Grenadillo. Now, I think this is probably because of the Gibson wood raids, and if you don't know anything about that, I will put a link below because it's actually a pretty fascinating bit of Gibson history. What I'm basically saying is that in a weird game of chess, it seems like Gibson said, Hmm, no ebony? 
No classic white finish. Did it matter in the end? Not really. Gibson phased them out. Now, in case you think I forgot, I saved the best for last, this guitar's case. And this was your classic Gibson faux leather case, but it had a leopard skin print on the inside. And on the outside, it had the little Green Day Electrocution Morning logo. I think this case was probably the best part of this guitar. In 2018, six years after the previous line was phased out, Gibson re-releases the Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. And having six years of reading why people hated that guitar, they were determined to make something that people hated even more. They took the much maligned H90 pickup and they replaced it with the even more disliked 57 Classic pickup. And no, it's not that people hate the 57 Classic pickup, it's that people hate that pickup in that guitar. People also didn't seem to be too keen about the pick card. What do you mean, you people? But it's not like Gibson just made something up and threw it on there. No, this actually has roots in Gibson history, this pick card. It's the same exact pick card on a double cutaway Les Paul Special, just adapted to fit on the Les Paul Junior. Gibson also swapped out the medium jumbo frets for low frets. Now, I have not played this guitar, so I don't know how low we're talking. I don't know if this is like fretless wonder low, but I can tell you that what I've read in the comments is it seems like, again, the majority of people did not really like these frets. Now, if you own this guitar, I'm definitely not trying to pick on you. This is just what I've observed and what I'm reporting. And if you like this guitar, really, that's all that matters. The tuning pegs were replaced as well. They used to be three on a tree, and now they were one individual for each string, which was just more in line with Gibson's manufacturing process at the time for the Les Paul Jr. And this Gibson was available in three finishes, Maritino Cherry, Sonic Blue, and ebony. The ebony finish had a five-ply tortoiseshell pickguard, whereas the Maritino Cherry and the Sonic Blue had a white pickguard. In my opinion, this guitar looks like a toy, but I do think that's by design. There's actually an interview with Billy Joe Armstrong where he specifically mentions that he wanted to design a guitar for kids to buy that was sort of a blank canvas for them to slap stickers on and carve their names in. And in keeping in spirit with the Les Paul Jr., it was sort of an entry-level guitar. Unfortunately, times change, Gibson is now Gibson, and I don't think a lot of 10-year-olds were buying $1,400 guitars. Actually, it doesn't seem like a lot of people were buying them in general because Gibson phased them out shortly after that with rumors that they kind of only sold a couple hundred models of these. And to add insult to injury, if you did buy this guitar, you didn't even get the cool case. You just got your standard Gibson faux leather brown case with the pink interior. So while Gibson's busy canceling the ugly duckling of the <laughs> So while Gibson's busy canceling the ugly duckling of the Les Paul Jr. series, Epiphone is busy working on the inspired by Gibson series of guitars. And in 2020, they released their own version of the Les Paul Jr. Now if we fast forward one year, they release the Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. edition in 2021. It actually comes out in two models. One of them is the entry level version, which is sort of like a guitar players pack and it comes with a gig bag and a little 5 or 10 watt amp and the guitar itself has a bolt on neck. And then the other version is this one right here which is their more or less signature edition of the Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. Now if we fast forward one more year Gibson re-releases the Les Paul Jr. Billy Joe Armstrong edition in 2022 and that is this guitar here on my left. So these are two models, two Les Paul Juniors, one Epiphone, one Gibson. Let's get into it. As to be expected, the Gibson is more expensive than the Epiphone. This comes in at $2,200, this comes in about $550. So it's roughly four times the cost. Now, I know you know that it's more expensive and I know that I know it's more expensive, but I'm sure I'm still gonna get comments that say, that guitar's a rip off, why don't you just get the Epiphone? That's fine if that's your opinion about it. That's not really the spirit of this review. I mean, it's it's more about somebody that's looking to buy one of these guitars and is wondering, is it worth splurging on the Gibson or should I get the Epiphone? And maybe they don't know. Maybe this is genuinely for that person so they can make that decision for themselves. The Gibson model comes with a Gibson Deluxe protector case and a very bright pink finish and the Gibson logo embossed into the top shell. Open it up and you get a cool leopard skin print lining the entire interior and storage compartment. Inside the storage compartment, you get a Gibson strap and a goodie bag. And inside that bag, a warranty card, the Gibson owner's manual, a polishing cloth, the Gibson multi-tool, 
the infamous Gibson baby photo, and lastly, the keys to the castle. Moving over to the Epiphone, you get a nice, sleek, faux leather black case with the Epiphone logo printed over the neck area and a Green Day Warning Electrocution Guy logo at the body portion of the case. Once open, you get that familiar leopard skin print lining the entire insides, open up the compartment, and you get some cardstock with a Gibson app advertisement. All the Epiphone stickers you could ever want, the Epiphone warranty card, a Gibson toe tag proudly displaying that, yes, they put strings on their guitar, a single adjustment tool, which we'll talk about in a second, and the keys to the case. When it comes to the cases themselves, I'm actually impressed with both of them. I think the bright pink with the leopard skin interior is very stunning, and I think it looks really badass. However, the Epiphone offering, and I do understand that that's kind of a clone of the first Billy Joe Armstrong guitar case, is actually really cool, and to me it screams Green Day more than the pink, per se. Now, if I had my druthers, I would combine both of these two cases, and I would have the pink deluxe protector case with that electrocution logo on black somewhere on the outside, and then the leopard skin print on the inside. That would be really something. Moving on to the case candy themselves, the Gibson offerings are pretty standard for most Gibson models. I do wish that they would put in documents specific to the guitar. For example, I read for 10 minutes about a three-way selector switch and volume knobs for a neck pickup that does not exist on either of these guitars. When it comes to the Epiphone, I'm happy to get 3,000 stickers, but I would much rather have something like a strap, which even if they threw in one like the Gibson strap, which is kind of a piece of crap. So I think it's certainly more useful. Uh, the tool that they give you is nice. It's basically to adjust the saddle screws there. I don't know if you can see those or if it'll focus in time. But it also would have been nice if they gave you some sort of tool to adjust the truss rod, which I understand is probably not something you're going to do yourself, but it's, um, maybe you will. I, I don't know. Maybe you live in the Ozarks or something. Anyway, let's move on. For me, the style of these guitars is very similar. The first thing I notice when I look at them is the P90 staring at you right in the face. Everything else is pretty identical. Single cutaway, uh, wraparound bridges, two knobs, tone and volume, the black pick guard, necks all look the same, dot inlays. It's a guitar designed around simplicity of function, and it excels at that. If it didn't excel at that, we wouldn't be talking about it nearly 70 years later. But it is literally just a slab of wood, no carved top, no contouring. They don't even really bother to get rid of this excess wood here. Although, that's kind of more for nostalgia because there were some years where they did get rid of that. And again, the masses complained about that. Moving on to the body, these bodies are both mahogany. And with the finishes not being clear, it's impossible to know how many pieces of wood make up each one but I would guess somewhere between three and four pieces of wood glued together. Now, seeing as these are entry-level models, it's not exactly like Gibson is saving the best wood for these, Billy Joe Armstrong model or not. What I do find interesting about these guitars is the Gibson is a quarter of an inch longer in this dimension than the Epiphone and a quarter of an inch longer in the width. And yes, while you might be guessing that's gonna affect the scale a little bit, you would be correct. However, probably not in the way that you think. When I measured the Gibson scale, I get 12 and a quarter inches from the nut to the 12th fret. When I measure the Epiphone scale, I get 12 and a half inches from the nut down to the 12th fret. Putting the Epiphone closer to 25 scale and the Gibson closer to 24 and a half scale. Now again, with that being kind of more of a theoretical thing, it's not really going to matter too much, but for the sake of thoroughness, I'm sure there's some players that are going to look into that and maybe that's something to consider. And again, that could also just be the models that I have. You never know with quality control these days. Under the pick guards, there's nothing special. There's no love letters or secret routing. It's basically just three holes that hold in the screws for the pick guard. If you flip them around to the back side, you'll get a small cavity that has the controls. And again, that's about it. And lastly, both of these guitars have a two and a half to three degree breakaway angle for the neck from the body. Both of these guitars have a mahogany neck. The Gibson has a rosewood fretboard, whereas the Epiphone has a laurel fretboard. 
And the Gibson also has what's described as the Billy Joe Armstrong Slim Taper Profile, and the Epiphone has a 50s neck profile. The nut on both of these is Graftech. The Gibson measuring in at 1.65, and the Epiphone measuring in at 1.70 inches. The first fret on the Gibson measures in at 0.81 inches, and down at the 12th, it's 0.88 inches. So it's a very thin neck all the way through. Moving on to the Epiphone, the first fret measures 0.86, and down on the 12th, you get 0.98 inches. Both of these fretboards are 12 inch radius through and through. Both of these guitars have medium jumbo frets, and both of them also have white fret markers going down the neck all the way to the 21st fret with your double dot at the 12 as usual. And lastly, the headstocks, the Gibson has slightly more of an angle back at 17 degrees, and you can see the Epiphone has their traditional 14 degree angle back. Moving on to the tuners, both guitars have deluxe tuners. You've got Gibson deluxe tuners for the Gibson, and you've got Epiphone deluxe for the Epiphone. Since the information isn't really out there, let's see what these measure in at. Starting with the Gibson, we've got one, two, three, 13, 14, okay, that's 14 to one. That's pretty common for these tuners, and I'm assuming the same for the Epiphone. Let's get into that. Let's see, one, two, three, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 to one. And that is actually a surprise to me, but to be honest with you, you can feel it when you're tuning the guitar and you have a little more precision, which is always appreciated. Moving on to the truss rods, Gibson has their traditional single action truss rod underneath the fretboard, which is adjustable through a hex socket. And if we move on to the Epiphone, they've actually got a dual action truss rod which is adjustable through a hex wrench. As mentioned before, we've got medium jumbo frets. Moving on to the strap buttons, Gibson likes to use this mushroom top design, whereas Epiphone likes to use this flower pot design. Personally, I think the mushroom style is a little more secure than the Epiphone, and I think on these guitars, the Gibson's looks a little more retro, whereas Epiphone's is kind of just the one they use on every guitar. Moving down to the bridge saddles, you've got an uncompensated saddle on the Gibson here, and you've got your traditional lightning bolt style compensated bridge here. And you can see on the Gibson, the actual angle of the saddle is helping to work with the intonation. Whereas on the Epiphone, it's more or less parallel, and that's because the lightning bolts are pretty much taking care of intonation for you. The bridge on the Gibson is the usual stamped aluminum from advanced plating. The Epiphone bridge is stamped Epiphone and has more ornate underside casting for the string channel. Mounting of these bridges is more or less the same with the bushings sunk into the body and the studs threaded into them and then just the tension of the strings holding the saddle in place. And lastly for hardware, both these guitars have a black jack plate down there for the guitar cable. The electronics on both of these guitars is relatively simple. You've got one pickup and one set of controls, a volume and a tone for each. The Gibson has a P90 DC pickup, and I believe the DC stands for its designer, which is Jim DeCola. And this pickup is based on the Sidewinder P90 from Seth Lover in the 50s. So it should have some sort of hum canceling to it. It does look a little bit different than a Sidewinder though, doesn't it? Maybe a little thinner, closer to a traditional P90. Apparently Gibson presented Billy with many different P90 pickups and Billy ended up choosing this one for this guitar. So I'm not really sure if the P90 DC is in any other guitars. If you know of it being in one, please let me know in the comments. I'll be curious to see how it sounds because the notion of any hum canceling P90 gets me a little skeptical these days. Now moving on to the backside of the electronics here, Cavity looks real nice and clean actually. Looks like modern wiring. It's hard to see, but it uh, looks like these are both 500K pots for the tone and the volume. Gibson likes to use those a lot now. And an orange drop capacitor. Nothing surprising in there, tight, clean wiring. Now let's move on to the Epiphone. The Epiphone chose to go closer to the traditional Les Paul Jr. and it has a P90 Pro pickup in here, which is basically Epiphone's version of the standard P90 pickup. And from what I've actually read, these get pretty glowing reviews. Now if we flip this around and look at the electronics, whoa, what's going on there? <laughs> That's uh, crazy. It looks like somebody butchered the inside of the cavity. There's chunks of wood missing. 
splinters. Well, that's the bad part. The good news is that underneath all this mess and craziness, the guitar is pretty traditional 50s wiring. Now, I'm not going to get into the difference between modern wiring and 50s wiring. I'll put a link for that to somebody that can explain it far better than I can, but I can say that I'm pleased they put it in this guitar and I'm actually looking forward to that. Now, if we move both of these guitars to the meter, the Gibson looks like it's at about 16.39 here, and the Epiphone reads about 8.54, so significantly hotter for the P90DC pickup. The Gibson has their usual nitrocellulose finish, and the Epiphone has their traditional poly finish. And like I've said in other videos, over time and with uh, extreme temperature fluctuations, the Gibson has a good chance of getting finish checking, Whereas the Epiphone's finish, while cheaper to make, is probably more durable, if not just a slight bit thicker and maybe a little bit heavier of a coating. These guitars both have plastic butter bean tuning heads there. And moving down, we've got the Graftech nut as mentioned before. Both guitars have just plain plastic dot inlays. I will say that the Gibsons are a tiny bit more pearlescent than the Epiphones, but they're pretty darn close. Both of these guitars have a black pickguard. The difference is that the Gibsons is a five-ply black-white, black-white, black pickguard, whereas the Epiphones is just a one-ply black pickguard. The pickup covers on both of these P90s is just the plastic dog ear style. Both of these guitars have black top hat style knobs there. 1 to 10 as usual. Both these guitars have black truss rod covers. The difference is that the Gibson has Billy Joe Armstrong's signature on it, whereas on the Epiphone it is on the back of the neck. Now personally I'm a big fan of the way Epiphone did it because then it's always part of the guitar, but converse to that line of thinking, maybe that's why it's on the truss rod cover so you can get rid of that and claim this as your own version of the guitar, not Billy's. And lastly, moving to the back side of the guitar, we've got a nearly identical control cavity cover there. The only difference being that the Epiphones has shielding on the inside. And that might be because we have a noisier P90 pickup in there, or it's more likely because Epiphone seems to put that on pretty much any of their guitars nowadays. Moving on to the feel of these guitars, they're very similar, but there's two things that blatantly stick out to me. One of them is the weight. The Gibson weighs in at seven pounds, five ounces, which is substantially lighter than the Epiphone, which weighs in at about seven pounds and 15 ounces. The second thing is very obviously the neck. I haven't been shy about it, but I'm much more of a fan of the 50s style necks than the slim taper necks. For these big dumb hands of mine, they just feel more comfortable. However, that being said, even though this neck was incredibly thin, even for a slim taper, I thought it was a little thinner. It feels okay. From the factory, both guitars were set up very well. I did change the strings, um, and I made very slight adjustments, but to both guitars, and that was for my preference. But right out of the boxes, they played great. I was curious if there would be a difference in feel between the nitrocellulose and the poly coating, as well as the rosewood versus the laurel fretboard. Personally, it wasn't anything that was a game changer. All right, so now we've gotten to the sound test, and I'm gonna show you guys a few different variations. I'll do some clean sounds and some gritty sounds, and I'm gonna mess around with the volume and tone knobs on each of these guitars, and I'll let you know on screen what they are, just so you have an idea of some of the sonic possibilities of both of these guitars. In addition to that, I'll also show you the neck dive since I'll be standing with the guitar on a strap. So anyway, let's dive into that now.
So there you have it guys, that's both of these guitars, and I'll admit, it's actually pretty tough for me to um, decide which one I like better. I mean, I think the P90DC is actually a pretty good pickup. I actually really enjoyed the way it sounds. I think the fact that they overwound it um, really helped kind of get rid of some of the muddiness, you know, that comes with um, like hum canceling pickups. Not muddiness, but mid-tones and things like that. So I do think that they modeled it pretty good after the regular P90, and I don't know if you can tell on the recordings or not, but it was noticeably quieter in regard to um, background noise and things like that. So in terms of quality for both these guitars, I think I've got issues with both of them. The Gibson, for example, the finish has some weird work done to it, especially where the neck joint is. There's some blotchiness on the paint there. It almost looks like Elmer's glue and then painted over it. There's also tooling marks on the fretboard. Stuff like that is it's kind of a bother, especially since I got this directly from Gibson, and I just figured if I was getting it from Gibson, they would make sure that whatever's leaving their factory straight to the customer's hands would be maybe the highest quality they've got, since they don't really have a middleman to blame it on, but I guess I was wrong with that. In terms of the Epiphone, uh, same sort of stuff. There's some tooling marks on the fretboard. There's also some weird sort of... Uh, die or, or something on a couple of these frets which is a little weird and then obviously the back cavity how that's just torn apart in there that's something i've never seen before assuming these guitars were the same exact price i think i would still give the edge to the epiphone i, I like the feature set that it had more um it's more comfortable for the way i play the neck was still really nice and fast considering it's a 50s profile i will say that the the slim taper on the Gibson um, was easier for soloing, but I'm not exactly the best soloist, and so therefore I don't solo that much. But I'm sure for other people, you know, that would be something that they would prefer. I also like the wiring, and I like the way that the tone and volume knobs um, behaved better on the Epiphone, whereas on the Gibson, it was sort of like you would roll off the tone and so it would be like very muddy. And then as you would roll off the volume, that muddiness would sort of slip away and it would become clearer as you got, as the volume went down. Whereas with the Epiphone, I felt like it was more of a true, as the volume went down, the muddiness kind of stayed. And what I think is interesting is I'm pretty sure that's the opposite of how 50s wiring is, but for whatever reason, that's just how it seemed to my ears. So. Anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments, and um, I will see you guys on the next one, which hopefully will be sooner than later. All right, next time.